Purdue and Boring U. Talking about uh, a person from childhood here, I'm sure he knows that this is a big step for me. <laughs> um, years ago, um, he, he was doing my homework for me in history class in high school because there's no way that I was going to get up and, and read in front of the class you know, full of my you know, co-students. And uh, it was one of those uh, those things that the teacher, it was based on, the grade was based on what the audience gave you. So I was, I was an athlete, so I think most people in the school knew me because I was a football player. And so when it came time to vote, um, oh, hey, 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 hey. So when it came down to it, I think they gave Dennis and his girlfriend a B because there's three of us because they allowed me in the group and I got a D. So <laughs> they, they didn't really work out. So public speaking for me was never uh, one of my strong things. But you know, uh, like Greg said, man, with the Lord, anything's possible, man. We need to step outside of our boxes and and do things. And this is this is definitely stepping outside of my box. And uh, this group of men that. Uh, have come together in the Bible study. Like I said, not just the guys that Greg announced, but we have 16 guys in our group on the calendar. And any given time, we have eight to 10 guys show up to Bible study, which is a big Bible study group. As Bible study goes, I know, I mean, I can only say from like the church that I go to, they recommend five, six guys. We've always had a lot. We've always been kind of the stepchildren of Temecula, South Temecula. So uh, I kind of like it that way. So, you know, uh, we're a diverse group, the Bible study. Uh, I think we have, I think we uh, came up, we have uh, six different churches represented at the Bible City Group. And mainly that's because of word of mouth and uh, just getting guys, meeting guys, and guys just, just joining the group. You know, it's not just about one church. So, with that said, um, today um, uh, we are planning on having Pastor Dale speak with us today. Not to downplay myself or to give myself any excuses. Uh, but I think it was on my heart. It, it just wasn't meant to be. Pastor Dell um, um, was to me like I was to Greg. He was instrumental in bringing me to the Lord. I mean, I, I, I was, I would have called myself a Christian before, but now I look back and go, man, I wasn't a very good Christian. You know, and um, so he was that person that put me on a pathway to where I'm at now. Um, so uh, I'd asked him to speak today. He's having some, some issues. Uh, with his health, mm. and when he called me the other day and said, Doug, you know what, I know it's the last minute, but I just can't do it, I, I'm not feeling well, I'm dizzy, you know, there's, I've got some stuff going on, Lord so, Jesus and, and I said, I go, Dale, you know what, not a problem, man, I'm available, I'm speaking, and a couple days prior to that, I listened to a podcast, and this is what it was at, and this was on my heart, and, um, and then it was reconfirmed, um, through some of the Bible studies that we were talking about. And then last night, again, Zach brought up Isaiah, how, it's, how he says, hey, Lord, Lord, I'm here, I'm willing, choose me, you know. <clears throat> so uh, this, this was meant to me for me to be here today. So today, what's been on my heart is us, men. We are appointed leaders. Whether you want to be or not, you are. Mm -hmm. uh, Colossians 3, 18 through 20 says, Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. So right there in that, he's telling wives to submit to your husbands. So that means you are the leader. Your wife, you are your wife's leader, no matter how you, how you look at, about, at it or how you go around it. You are your wife's leader. It doesn't say slave. But it, it, she is, you know, you are, or she is, uh, to be submitted to you. Uh, and children are supposed to obey us. That means we are their leader. Uh, it doesn't mean that they obey what we say and they do whatever they want. They obey because we are the leader of the household. We are their spiritual leader. And until, um, with like the help of Dell Curtis to show me that, you know, that I need to be the leader of my family. And like I said before, I thought I was a Christian, but then at that point, um, when I became the spiritual leader of my family, boy, did things so change, and for a positive thing. I'm not saying that um, there hasn't been challenges, 
Uh, there has been. There's been many challenges. But you know, I can never go back to where I was. Before. There's no way. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't ever see that. Things are so much better. Uh, my relationships are so much better. Um, so um, uh, maybe to back up just a step, too. I mean, at, at the point before uh, I went to my first ministry about six years ago, me and my wife, Christy, was a spiritual leader. She was, I wasn't. She was going to church. I don't know if you guys had the same story, but uh, she was going to church, taking the boys to church, and I was, I was staying home watching Sunday football. <coughs> and she was a spiritual leader, and she was patient and kind, and she did everything. And I look back now and go, man, she was, she was so strong for me when I was so weak. Uh, and now, and now that the rules have semi-reversed, I'm not saying she's still not a leader in my, in my life, because she is. Um, because in Matthew 20, uh, verses 26 through 28, it says, Whoever wants to become great among you must first be your servant. Um, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as ransom for many. So my wife had that servant's heart. She still does this day. And so uh, regardless if I was a spiritual or not, she was still serving me, you know, uh, I don't want to say in my little corner or anything, but I mean, I just she she was continuously service, serving me, supporting me, and everything I did, and I, I really appreciate that from her. And without her leadership, at that point in my life, I would not be where I'm at here today without her. So, um, as far as that last verse, you know, I mean, um, I mean, how many how many of you guys you know feel that about your family that you serve your kids? I mean, I know I know I have issues. My boys are here today listening. This is crazy, but um, trying to be transparent with them here, um, I try to serve them <coughs> with all my heart. Man, I do their laundry, I make their beds, I I love to come home from work in the morning and make them breakfast. Uh, I try to be their servant, you know, and, and I know. You know, my wife and I, you know, it doesn't make it any easier. It doesn't make it easy for us to do that. Because uh, you think, why aren't they making their own beds? Why aren't they doing their own work? They're old enough, you know. But is that truly a servant's heart? Or are you letting that, being caught up in that, uh, uh, in, in that, that game of life with uh, other men that aren't necessarily Christians that are influencing you to say, hey, they're, they're old enough. They should be doing their own. They should cook their own meals. They should be doing this and that. And, and that's great, but... Are you truly being a servant to your family? Um, but are you, are you your family's servant? And I, I would say I am. You know, uh, I work hard for them. Uh, I'm not not discounting my wife's hard work because she works hard too. Uh, but I truly feel that, uh, and not without having a lot of mistakes and being a sinner, I am a sinner. Uh, I truly believe that I am my family's servant. I know, I know there's a fine line there, um, but I think the fine line could be on the, more on the servant side than not on the servant side. So, um, um, one of the things with servitude comes up when I was, when I was doing writing this, I thought, and I brought this up in the Bible study many times, uh, do you know your family member's love language? Now, we've talked about this many times. You know, is it acts of service? Is it gifts? Is it... Words of affirmation. Uh, I know now what my boys and my wife's um, love language is, and I know that I can't come home and force my love language on my wife. I have to fulfill her love language, and in return, she'll fulfill my love language. I know that as a leader now that you know I just can't come home and grow up my wife. And hug her and kiss her and say, "Okay, I mean, you know, it's, I'm home." You know, um, I know that that's not my wife's love language. That may be mine, but that's not hers. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, uh, and and how about your friends? How about your your uh, Bible study buddies? How about your church buddies? Do you know their love language? Do you know that um, Greg's love language is like words of affirmation? When I talk to Greg and I, I'm positive with him, I see that positive glow from him. I think, Doug, man, I really needed that. Thanks, man. So, you know, I'm not saying I know everybody's love language in my group, but Greg and I have been connected for a while. So, I, you know, I, I, I see. I mean, <coughs> guys, I, I would say uh, um, 
Good love language may involve a lot of sexual uh, contact or physical touch. Um, that's my love language. But I think everyone has every love language in certain, some greater than others. You know, I think most men, you know, um, like the physical touch. So if I do the acts of service, I'm returning to physical touch. That's, that's the way it works. At least in my house it does. Um, and as far as other men, uh, and this is one of our, our, our slogans to church, Proverbs 27, 17, uh, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So, uh, I mean, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. I mean, he's saying, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Men need other men. Men need other men in their lives. Just as much as women need other women in their lives. There's things that, um, for me personally, there's things that other men can do in my life that my wife or no other woman can do. Um, and, and same for them. I know that I can't fix my wife as much as I'm a man and I want to fix her, fix things are wrong. I know that I can. And it, maybe it took me a thousand times for her to tell me, leave me alone. You can't, don't, you know, don't try to fix me. It took me, you know, a million times to do that. Um, but I know that, I, I t hey, honey, you know, hey, call, um, call Brenda. Call one of the girls in your Bible study group. Because I, I know I can't help you. I'll support you. I'll be here for you. I'll be outside mowing the lawn. I'll do some laundry. Go talk to one of your friends. Because I know that I can't, I can't fix her. I can't help her. So, uh, I've come to that in realization. So, um, uh, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 2, and then verse 5. To the elders among you, I appeal to you as a fellow elder, as witness of Christ's sufferings, and on who also we share in the glory to be revealed. But shepherds of God's flock that are under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing. And then verse five is, young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So in the same sense as, you know, um, men being leaders, we need to realize that, um, Older men, no offense, Jim, um, <laughs> have wisdom above us younger men. And us younger men have went wisdom over our children. And um, I, I la now I laugh when people say, well, you know, my marriage didn't come with a, um, with a manual. Or my kids, when I, my kids were born, they didn't have a manual. <laughs> yes, you do. You have the Bible. It's right there. Everything you need to know about the wisdom you need for your kids, for your wife, for your marriage, how to bring up your kids, is right there in that manual. We do have a manual. It's, it's the Holy Bible. So, uh, I, I kind of laugh now. Maybe this, I don't mean to laugh out loud at people, but <laughs> sometimes I do. Right? You know? <laughs> Only I'm rich sometimes. <laughs> no, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that manual is there. We just need to share with other men that manual and say, hey, hey, bro, you having a problem with your marriage? Come check this out. There's a manual right here. Uh, things that happened over 2,000 years ago are still true today. It's a living Bible, man. It's not, it's not, well, that was in the past. I hear so much now. It's, it, uh, yesterday, you know, watching Fox News. I don't know if you guys watched that or not. You know, it's like, oh, the Constitution's old. We need to get rid of that first amendment, you know, the rights we're going to come up with. We're going to come up with new stuff. Because that's old and outdated. Like, dude, our founding fathers founded this country in God we trust, man. It's on our, it's on our notes. I mean, it's, it's right there. They knew <clears throat> that we were going to fail as a country if we didn't follow right. basic rules. And the, the, the very basic rule is in God we trust. Every monument, every, everything that from the founding fathers you look at, it's all biblically based. In God we trust, basically. What else can I say? Um, 
So, I mean, I try. Uh, I know it takes time to gain wisdom. Uh, that's why we need to listen to our older population, man. We need to listen to them and respect them, get the wisdom from them. Um, I mean, I, I, I grew up, growing up, I made the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. Now, finally, I, I think I finally learned. I'm not saying I don't make mistakes still, or and even say sometimes the same mistakes again, but I'm like, oh man, that's that same thing, you know. I think I'm becoming more. I'm, I'm more aware of it now. Um, so, uh, and, and for my boys, we talk about this in the men's group, you know. I, man, because because I wasn't a Christian where I'm at now in my life, you know, it's that whole thing. I mean, I wish I knew, you know, then what I know now. Uh, I'm not, I'm not trying to, um, you know, gravel in that. I'm trying to move forward, but I feel like I'm behind the ball with my boys. I mean, um, leading the Bible study and showing them that, hey, the Lord is here for you, man. You just have to ask. Uh, it's great now. But I want to give them all the wisdom that I have and all the wisdom that Jim has because he shares with me. And I don't want them to make the same mistakes that I made. I know sometimes that it's going to happen. Um, but the same things happened 2,000 years ago. You know, let's learn from those things. Let's learn the Bible and not make the same mistakes and let's move forward. I want my boys to move forward from what I had to go through to get to where I'm at now. I'm not saying it was bad and I won't I don't regret anything that I did. Well maybe maybe a few things. Maybe five things. Uh, without counting, maybe ten. But um, where I'm at now, I mean where I'm at now, all those things made me the person that I am now. So I can't say that. I don't want those things to happen to my boys. I truly don't want some of the things to happen to me, or I did, my boys to do. Um, but I want to share with them some of the mistakes that I made. And so that they gain the wisdom that, hey man, my dad already did this, I don't want to do this again, I don't want to do that. You know, so. Matthew 7, this is kind of my closing verse here for you guys today. Matthew 7, 24 and 26. Therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and put them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. All my houses are built on a rock. Then verse 26, but everyone who hears these words and does, does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house in sand. I want to have my house on the rock. Um, I mean, like I said, the, the rock, man. I want, I want to think of the rock. I want to think of the cornerstone. The cornerstone that church means that, that no matter what happens in my life, cornerstone will always be my rock, the cornerstone of where I'm at now. No matter, how, no matter where I go from here, that's the rock. That's the rock that, the foundation uh, that started. So, with that, let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for broken you up, for opening up the, the, the restaurant for us. And just thank you for the cooks, for everyone that uh, had an instrumental part of uh, starting this, this ministry. Lord, thank you for, for showing me that I can I can step outside the box with you, Lord, and you can you can give me the words and the peace of my heart uh, to share with other men, Lord. Yes. Uh, just thank you for this blessed day, Lord. Amen. 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 All right. Good work, brother.